Good morning, everyone. I guess I was very eager to come up on stage uh, uh, to moderate this session. My name is Juliana Kwa, and uh, I'm the Assistant CEO of International Group. I just took over this role in November last year after four and a half years uh, with STB in Beijing covering Greater China. Um, I think I am personally thrilled to be helming a session that is called Singapore Reopening to the World. And I'm sure many of you in the room, or perhaps everybody in the tourism industry is delighted as well that we can now speak about this topic in earnest. I am delighted to have with me three wonderful speakers from the industry um, to talk about this topic. So first of all, I'd like to invite Mr. Glenn Maguire from Visa to join me on stage. So Glenn is the principal Asia Pacific economist for Visa, and Glenn keeps a close watch on emerging opportunities in the trillion dollar payments industry, layering this with economic analysis of the dynamic Asia region. Glenn is an active participant in the World Economic Forum's Future of Consumption System Initiative, which he, where he helps to identify the economic and behavioural trends shaping the future of commerce in Asia. Glenn spent 20 years in banking and in the last 15 years has lived in a number of Asian cities. So I'm sure Glenn, with his uh, economics background, with his banking background, with his ex experience in Asia, will be able to share many insights for us here in the room. Next, I would like to invite someone who is familiar and dear to many of us, Campbell Wilson, CEO of Scoot Airways. So Campbell joined SIA in 1996 in New Zealand and has been posted to many parts of the world with SIA, including Australia, Canada, Hong Kong, and Japan. As we all know, he's also had stints in SIA headquarters, including revenue management and network planning, and of course, most recently, as SVP of sales and marketing. This is Campbell's second stint as CEO of Scoot, as he was previously the founding CEO of Scoot between 2011 to 2016, before the airline merged with Tiger Air. So again, I'm sure we'll be able to gain, glean a lot of insights from Campbell uh, through his many years uh, around the world as well as in the airline um, industry. Last, but certainly not least, we have online with us from Jakarta, Caesar Indra, president of Traveloka. Hey, Caesar. Hello, hi. As president of Traveloka, Caesar is responsible for fostering collaboration with stakeholders in the ecosystem, including businesses of all sizes and government relations, as well as leading the company's fintech group. Prior to his appointment as president, Caesar had held numerous roles within Traveloka, including leading Transport, Traveloka's largest business unit, where his leadership led to Transport's 20 times top line growth in just five years. Before that, um, Caesar had done stints in Boston Consulting Group and as a software engineer in a Seattle-based tech startup. And he has become a strong believer that tech can make the world a better place to live in. And so again, Caesar, I think, will be able to share on a plethora of, of uh, 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 areas. And uh, uh, I hope that we will all have a, a good session later. So I will first start. Um, by sharing a little bit more um, in-depth following on from uh, Minister of State Elvin Tan and Keith's um, presentations. Then I will give the floor to each of the speakers to give a short presentation just to set some context. And after that, I will ask a few questions to get the ball rolling because as always, uh, as many times with us in Singapore, perhaps we need a little bit of warm-up. But really, this session is for all of you. So we would love to take as many questions as possible from all of you. So Slido has already been set up, so you already have questions. Please keep them coming in already. So without further ado, I will kickstart my presentation. So um, we can move to the next slide. So I think as Keith had mentioned uh, uh, earlier, 
Singapore, based on our annual brand health study, uh, brand health study, Singapore does remain a preferred destination among all our key markets. We have seen that there is strong intention to travel within the next uh, 12 months, and while a lot of places in the world have sort of moved on to being fully endemic, there is still some concern about wanting to travel to a safe destination. I just came back from the US three weeks ago and from London, Brussels and Paris last week, and I can personally vouch that safety is still very much something that travellers are thinking about as they plan their next um, trip. Next slide. And then, one set of data is our own brand health study. Another set of data is, of course, Google. Uh, and Google has kindly shared um, this set of data with us. If I can orientate you, the chart on your left is actually airline searches after we announce our vaccinated travel framework in the last week of March. The line in grey is 2019 search numbers, and the line in blue is 2022 search numbers. So you can see the, the, around the time that we announce our new framework, airline uh, search went back up to uh, 2019 numbers, which I think is something that we're all um, very encouraged by. While accommodation search did not reach back um, to, and this is for Singapore specifically, sorry. And while accommodation searches did not yet come back to 2019 numbers yet, there's been a huge jump um, to close to about 75% of accommodation searches for Singapore as compared to 2019 during the same period. So again, I hope that shows that people are not just coming back for visiting friends and relatives, but they're also coming back for business and starting to think about us for leisure. And I guess the other very encouraging statistic that, we, uh, that Google kindly shared with us is that we were the most popular destination search for Indonesia we were the second most popular search for Malaysia, and we were eighth most popular for India and Australia. And I think this corroborates with our data from March 2022. As you can see from the chart um, on, on the bottom right, um, about 50% of our uh, visitor arrivals in March 2022 came from these four key markets, Australia, Malaysia, India, um, and Indonesia. And we do anticipate that in the near term, these, will, these nearer markets will be the markets that will be driving more volume, even though, of course, we are still hunkering, we are still going all out in our longer haul markets to get more traffic from there in due course. Next slide, please. And I know we've shared this with you over the last two years, but I just wanted to reiterate that our offices all over the world in the last 24 months have not stepped back on doing marketing to keep Singapore top of mind among travellers. So this slide just gives a small sample of all the wonderful work that my colleagues have been doing in market. Um, maybe I could just uh, cite uh, uh, one example, um, and that's the one on your right, which is uh, in France. Actually, my team was uh, looking at a three-pronged a PR approach for the Singapore Food Festival last year. And in total, um, it, we also tied up with a local restaurant to push out uh, Peranakan food to the French, uh, a potential French visitor. And I guess the proof is in the pudding. In total, we got 49 million impressions over that period of the campaign. Maybe another example I can cite is um, pre, uh, our largest market pre-COVID in China, where I, I was the last um, five years. We tied up with Douyin or TikTok to many of you. And for the first time, it was a co-investment where they were also very interested in the, the, the marketing campaign that we were pushing out. We actually did a mystery box unveiling, both offline and online um, in Be Beijing, Shanghai, Chengdu, and Guangzhou um, in late 2021 and 2022. The campaign still continues, and we've garnered over 80 million um, uh, impressions, as well as what many of you care about, 44 million engagements across all the different platforms. So that's what we've been doing over the last 24 months and will continue um, to, to do. But uh, next slide, where I'll be able to share with you that in the last few months since we launched the first VTL, actually we've been ramping up engagements 
and tactical uh, uh, conversion campaigns, which again, I know for many in the room, that is the most, uh, that is as critical as all our passive uh, marketing work. Again, what's on the slide is just a small sample of everything that um, we have been doing, but just to highlight a couple, in Australia, ever since the, the VTL uh, was announced last November, um, we've been pushing out across PR, across our media channels, um, uh, uh, the news that Singapore um, is open, and of course, since last uh, a couple of weeks, we have been pushing it out more, even more aggressively, and I'm happy to share that we actually have reached over 20 million, uh, the reach is over 20 million, and that's almost the size of, of uh, Australia's population. So we'll, we'll continue to push that out. We've already launched the campaign with, uh, uh, finished the campaign with Qantas. We're in the midst of uh, a campaign with Hello World, and we have many others lined up with SIA, as well as other um, uh, key uh, travel intermediaries uh, for, for the next uh, few months. Um, yep, okay. And then, of course, um, I, I think for many of us, Indonesia is uh, something that, that is top of mind as well. We are all hoping that, um, we are all hoping that travel will be coming back uh, full swing uh, very soon. And so over the last few months, especially the last two weeks, because Indonesia, as all of you know, opened up, uh, the tr quarantine-free travel between us opened up more uh, recently. So we've been doing a number of PR activities um, uh, uh, and pushing out information on our own channels in Facebook and WhatsApp. And we have a large um, relaunch uh, of Singapore Reimagine campaign in, planned for in May um, this year, um, as we anticipate that perhaps for the next month or two in April, um, there will still be a lot of pent-up demand, but come May, we want to relaunch Singapore Reimagine um, so as to uh, stimulate even more travel. And of course, we have uh, lots of tactical campaigns lined up. Our partnership with Kluk has already um, started uh, in terms of uh, reminding uh, Indonesians that uh, uh, Singapore is, is welcoming them again. And we have others lined up with Agoda, um, with uh, Traveloka, of course, and uh, um, uh, other, and, and Trip too. Okay, so my final slide uh, just summarizes some of the key insights that we have gathered uh, from our regional um, offices. So we are all optimistic that recovery is coming. While we are not expecting a linear immediate um, recovery, we are hopeful that in the short term, regional markets will be the ones driving some volume into Singapore. And in the next few months, longer haul markets will be also coming back um, in full swing. But no matter, my teams um, and the whole of STB are working hard to uh, go full out in all the markets, and we really need your partnership. So before I, I pass on the time, I just wanted to make a plug for our breakout sessions in the afternoon. I know many of you will, will want to know what exactly is happening in each of the markets. So actually all the markets, all our key markets will be doing a a quick session about five to ten minutes later to share with you what they're doing and how you can come in and be part of that journey. Okay, so without further ado then, I shall now pass on the time to Glenn for him to take you through some context as well. Glenn? Thank you very much, Julie, and good morning, everyone. Visa as a payments network is well positioned to talk about the return to travel and the recovery in travel. Uh, we process around 65,000 transactions per second. And in terms of cross-border spend, we see around one in every three dollars across our network. So when we look at that data, we start to get a picture by looking at domestic in foreign countries of how travel is evolving and also contextualize the purpose of that travel. So let's have a look at that on the next slide. And I'm showing here a visualization uh, that many of you may be familiar with. For those who haven't traveled uh, in the past two years, you used to see this on the seat front in front of you. Um, it's a map of the world. And what we've done is we're looking at the recovery in travel in 2021 compared to 2090. And we can see that it's been very uneven and that we're seeing Europe and the US 
and sort of the northern part of Latin America leading the recovery at this stage. Now, when we look at the journey from 2020 to 2021, globally, global travel recovered 20% of its market share in 2020 and 31% by 2031. When we look at Europe, it improved more from 22% to 48%. When we look at North America, it was roughly steady at 25% and 25%. But when we look at the Asia Pacific, travel in 2020 was just 11% of its 2019 levels. And in 2021, it was just 3%. So it was going against the global grain. And I just wanted to click through those three regions and talk through the reason why we think this is happening. So if we click for the first animation, which highlights North America, we can see that travel has rebounded by around 30%. But one of the dynamics we're seeing, and it's also coming through with our soft survey data, is beach destinations are very popular. They're trending very strongly. And when we ask our customers why this is the case, one of the feedbacks we get is they're concerned about the deterioration of the travel experience. If they go to a city and their favorite museum is closed or their capacity constraints and they can't go to their usual restaurant. So beach destinations are trending strongly because a beach is a beach and the quality of that experience is unchanged. If we click on to the next slide that highlights Europe, what we can see is a nice even recovery. And one of the key call-outs is that travel is recovering first in neighbouring countries. That's where we see the strongest travel recovery, up 48% for travel to a country that you have a land border with. Then short haul is enjoying the second strongest recovery, travel under 3,000 kilometres. And if we look at Europe, we can see that it basically reflects the evenness of the vaccination process. So people felt safer traveling in that regional um, perimeter than long haul travel at that stage. Now, if we move on to Asia Pacific, we can see that we haven't seen that same recovery. So if we click for the next animation, yes. Um, the travel recovery has slowed in 2021, but I think that reflects the fact that short haul is not really a dynamic. Australia is 5,000 kilometres across. Tokyo to Jakarta is 8,000 kilometres. So we really needed to see that evenness in vaccination. So the rollout of vaccination and the success of vaccination over the second half of 2021 and the fact that most of our neighbouring countries are going to hit 70% vaccination rates early this year really lays the foundation for the recovery in regional travel this year. Now, whilst we haven't been able to travel, we have been on journeys and we have been able to discover. And that discovery has been our local communities. And on the next few slides, I just want to quickly show one of the programs that I'm really proud that Visa has sponsored, Where You Shop Matters. And as an organization, we really have invested in small businesses, in helping them go online. And as we look at re the reopening of Singapore, essentially we're all ambassadors and we've all been on our own journey rediscovering Singapore. So just three call outs on the next slide in terms of the small businesses that uh, we've sponsored. One, eclectic, different, bespoke small businesses where you go steady, must buy, matters. That's been an important call out. On the next slide in the food and beverage space where you go, mmm, she ok, that's also been really important in sort of helping brand the cultural identity. And tying into the wellness theme that Chief Executive and Minister Tan mentioned earlier on the final slide, um, where you go, wa sui is also very, very important. So this rediscovery of Singapore really does position us as we reopen as brand ambassadors and salespeople for our own journey of discovery 
over this period. Thank you. Thank you so much, Glenn. Yeah, I'll now pass the time over to Campbell. Okay, I've only got five slides, but I thought I'd try and distill some of the data that we're seeing as not just Scoot, but the Singapore Airlines Group, so that you get a sense of uh, what we're seeing and how it might impact you. So Glenn has talked about the vaccination rates, but the critical impediment to travel was the artificial constraints uh, coming from border closures. Uh, people's ability to travel was constrained, but not seemingly their desire, because as and when we've seen constraints ease, traffic has rebounded quite quickly. Glenn's slides showed that was the case in intra-US, in Latin America, in the EU, and for a period in 2021 when Australia was reasonably open, there was a significant recovery in domestic Australia. From the Singapore's perspective, we saw a really quick rebound as a consequence of the VTLs that were opened originally to the EU and to the US. Um, and more latterly, as the VTLs have expanded within this region, we've seen a recovery. And I'll show you a slide in a couple of minutes that really reinforces that point. So really, overall, what we're seeing is that people's fear is abating and the desire to travel very much remains. In terms of the sequence of recovery, I think it's no surprise to anyone that VFR is the first off, off the blocks. People have been isolated from loved ones for a few years. Uh, but that, is, that spikes and then comes down to a, a, a lower level. But we are seeing a resurgence in leisure. Uh, there is a strong element of revenge travel. People are, at least for the first trip, treating themselves to a higher cabin class in the aircraft, a higher class of hotel on destination. And there is a huge desire seemingly to burn down the frequent flyer points that people have accrued uh, dining and shopping during the pandemic and not being able to fly. Uh, but also part of leisure is the youth market. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we're all a little, little bit past that age, but I'm, you know, in our early 20s, we all wanted to explore the world. Uh, and we're seeing a strong resurgence in the young traveler. Uh, and whilst it might not be a market that traditionally is of huge interest to us, we perceive it as low value, uh, us as a Singapore ecosystem, um, it is the market that's present, so yeah, it's the market we should be taking advantage of. And the third, I guess, cab off the rank is business. Business is taking longer to recover for all of the reasons that I'm sure you can posit for yourself. Uh, I have no doubt that it will recover fully, but it is lagging the other two segments. Uh, from an SIA group network perspective, we have reinstated about 70% of the cities that we operated pre-pandemic. That's about 97 cities in 34 countries. Um, in terms of capacity, it's at the moment, it's between 44 and 57. It was 44 in February uh, this month. We should be at 57% of pre-COVID capacity. So network breadth is being restored and seat capacity is quickly being restored. The greatest uncertainty, especially for Scoot, is the continued closure of mainland China. Uh, we don't have any clear visibility on when that is going to open. We are ready to act uh, if and when it does. Uh, and it's something that I'm sure you're keenly awaiting for Scoot. Pre-COVID, we had 105 flights a week to some 20 odd cities in mainland China. At the moment, we have two flights a week to two cities. It is that material. So the impediments for recovery uh, we've talked about PDTs, you know, we all know, I, I know the government is looking at uh, removing them, but for, the, for as long as they exist, they add cost, hassle and uncertainty. They're not conducive to the restart of tourism. We talk about the relaxation of SMMs in Singapore, they're very, very welcome. It's wonderful now compared to what it was before, but we need to keep in mind the SMMs relative to the other destination options for travellers. Those of you who have travelled to the US, to Australia, to Europe, uh, you know, the Singapore experience doesn't quite equate yet, and so you know, that needs to equalise. And I think, as Keith mentioned, uh, you know, share of voice is going to be critical. Uh, I couldn't tell you the number of delegations that we have received from tourism bodies from around the world, uh, all seeking Scoot and SIA's assistance to rebuild their own tourism markets. So it's absolutely critical that Singapore gets out there is present, is visible. I think the videos that were shown by Keith today are absolutely fantastic. They're inspiring, they're uplifting, uh, but let's make sure that Singapore is front and centre in people's consideration set. So finally, the, the slide I wanted to share uh, was this one. This is a, a snapshot of the revenue and load factor growth for April departures. It's a snapshot as at the end of March. The grey at the very bottom was last April's revenue and load factor. The yellow 
and the blue line is the revenue and load factor growth uh, that we're seeing for this coming April. I think there's no comparison. You know, the, the scale of the, the yellow is just off the charts relative to the gray, but most importantly, look at the steepness of the line. That indicates how much volume, how much demand, and, and how much action we are now seeing. Um, the other element to consider is you know, most of this growth is happening in the, you know, the, the month before the month of departure, so at most 60 days before departure. It is late. And whether this is just a consequence of the, the new travel framework or whether it's a consequence of, of new travel patterns, you know, time will tell. But uh, certainly it's something that we need to be cognizant of. I hope this slide gives you some optimism. It certainly gave me some when I first saw it. Thank you. Thank you, Campbell. Maybe I could ride um, off Campbell's comments just to share uh, a couple of uh, things as well. So the first is um, when, when I was in, in London, which uh, as I know everyone in the room knows, UK is sort of at the forefront of opening up and having their Freedom Day. Um, many trade and media shared with me that anecdotally their um, leisure traffic has actually recovered to about 80 to 90 percent of pre-pandemic. Uh, of course, many of, much of that is still regional travel, just like Glenn had mentioned, but I thought that 80-90% was a really encouraging figure for us. Business travel has lagged a little bit, but it is already at 50-60%. Um, uh, so I think if we, were look, if we were to look to the UK as sort of um, the path that one a travel destination uh, might take, I think I remain hopeful, um, just like uh, Campbell um, mentioned, that it, it, uh, leisure traffic uh, will be the next wave. And again, writing off what uh, Campbell had shared just now in terms of getting the message out um, that we are open, that Singapore is open and they're ready to welcome um, travellers again. Um, I think as I was speaking to all um, our, our STB officers uh, uh, um, overseas, um, the, one of the key moves that we need to make is to tell the media and tell the trade that we are back. So I know many of you in the room have been hosting our fans. Actually, just in the course of uh, the, the last uh, a few months, we've had uh, over 50 um, fam, fam trips uh, of varying sizes from media and trade and actually we are raring to invite uh, more. In fact, the, I, I, the, 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 what we're being told in certain markets is that um, because the travel agents and the tour operators are busy ramping up and doing business, so they're not able to yet come for the, the trade fams that we've invited them for. But we are certainly ramping up both our media and trade fans to really get the message out that Singapore is ready to welcome travellers again. Yeah. So with that, um, I'll pass it on to our third speaker, um, Caesar, to share uh, some context with Caesar. Thanks, Juliana. Um, I'm equally uh, excited to hear um, the insight and optimism shared by Glenn and Campbell. Um, maybe uh, allow me to just uh, do a refresher and a reintroduction of what Traveloka is quickly uh, to the audience here. So Traveloka is uh, Southeast Asia lifestyle super app. We offer uh, more than 20 products um, uh, and services across three categories, travel, local services, and fintech. Um, we started as an OTA in 2012, but uh, over the years, we've been using technology to uh, solve consumer problem throughout their lifestyle journey. And we, uh, we want to empower our users to discover the world around them. And uh, by doing that, we hope that we can fulfill their lifestyle aspiration. Um, next slide, please. This past two years um, presented both challenges and opportunities to, to the industry and, and to Traveloka. For Traveloka, we, make sure that, we made sure that our services were still relevant to the new consumer behaviors during the pandemic by introducing a number of features and services to address our customer challenges during uh, this period. Just to give you an example, we, had, uh, we launched a feature to find and book nearby ART and PCR tests through partnership with uh, hundreds of clinics across four countries in Southeast Asia. We extended our uh, restaurant directory, um, which was designed initially to help our users to discover restaurants around them in their uh, travel destinations. Um, 
uh, we extended into a food delivery service because most of the uh, travelers stayed at home and, and it was quite a successful uh, product so far. Uh, we allow flexibility by working with partners with hotels um, and launching by now stay later as a new requirement for travelers during the pandemic. Um, and one of the uh, very successful one is Traveloka Live. It's a live streaming, interactive live streaming feature uh, that allows us to engage with our consumer live. And we regularly invite our partners, our operators to promote their products uh, and engage directly with, uh, uh, with, with uh, Traveloka users across uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, this is just some of the examples um, of our features, the, the, the live streaming here, you can see the host um, uh, interacting with the users. We promote the products live there, the hotel um, that is part of our live streaming um, program um, and, and also uh, some of the, uh, the local experiences uh, that participated in the program. Next slide, please. So when governments across uh, Southeast Asia started relaxing restrictions within uh, their own uh, country, uh, tourism has gradually recovered, but we slowly, um, we saw slightly uh, changing uh, interest in the experiences. Uh, travelers seek more outdoor and nature type of experiences and willing to spend more time, uh, their time in exploring uh, less uh, popular experiences such as a hiking tour in, in Sentul uh, in Indonesia or picnic near paddy field. So this is a kind of a unique experiences that uh, in the past had never uh, been done. So this behavior is largely similar uh, across countries in Southeast Asia. The pandemic also has fundamentally altered consumer behavior across the region. With technology now provide uh, vital access to online shopping, food, healthcare, finance uh, and entertainment more than one in every three digital service consumers in Southeast Asia started using a new type of online service during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And, and of those uh, new digital consumers, nine out of 10 plan to keep using at least one digital service beyond the pandemic. So this new uh, habit will likely stay. What it means to tourism operators is that partnership with digital platform is more important than ever. Traveloka as a lifestyle super app has put partnership uh, as a key uh, priority and has worked closely with operators and local governments, uh, including the Singaporean government to ensure a speedy recovery in the tourism sector. And experienced operators uh, can focus on delivering great experience offline, while um, digital platform like Traveloka can focus on helping their services being discovered, um, their services being reached uh, uh, by Southeast Asian travelers into Singapore. Moving forward, we will continue to deepen our lifestyle app, uh, super app offerings and working closer than ever before with partners across the Southeast Asian markets. I'm looking forward to a great discussion about great tourism recovery. So much, Caesar. So I think um, Traveloka, what Caesar had shared, really epitomizes what STB has been talking about for the last two years to really use the pandemic to diversify um, its, its revenue uh, models and then to come out stronger and now be able to, I think, really leverage on the recovery of um, international travel. So I see that there are already a few questions um, trickling in, but I really would encourage uh, if you have any questions um, in your mind, do keep them coming in, but I'll just kick off by uh, uh, asking a more um, general question, which actually Glenn and um, Caesar had touched on briefly, but I wanted to uh, sort of uh, dig a little bit more, uh, dig a little bit deeper in terms of how during these two years, many of us are no longer used to, to leisure travel across borders. What do you think is the main change that um, has uh, uh, that travelers have had and how can Singapore or our stakeholders here um, attract them back to Singapore now that international travel um, has come back maybe I could start with Glenn 
Sure, thank you very much, Julie. And um, just to pick up on a point that Caesar had in his presentation, I think there was a very subtle but very important distinction, and that is between services and experiences. And that really is how the entire environment and ecosystem that we work in has evolved. People are not looking for services anymore. They're looking for experiences. It's like what Campbell noted with revenge travel. People are wanting to travel in a higher class to enjoy sort of the business class cabin, lounges and everything like that. And I think when we look at Singapore um, and this sort of journey of rediscovery that we've had over this period, I tend to view Singapore as more a city of villages. Uh, if I want to have Peranakan cuisine, I'll go to Katong. Uh, I can go to Little India. I can go to Chinatown. There's all these different areas of, Chi of Singapore that are absolutely unique in what they offer. And taking the time to really sort of immerse yourself uh, in those local communities is really, really important. And I think this has implications for small businesses. What we find is that over this period, um, the sort of mechanisms that we use to connect, and we talked about media has really changed. So we've seen an explosion in the creator economy, which is now 50 million people. It's the fastest growing business sector. And if we just look at the small subset, of uh, creators who are professional, that's 2.4 million, compared to around 37,000 newspapers globally, 18,000 radio stations, 12,000 TV stations. These are the people you need to connect with to amplify your message. We're finding the mega influencers, the people who have more than one million followers. Their engagement rates are plummeting. What we're seeing is it's the nano influences, people you may be one degree of separation from, people who are familiar with your local community who are making the more authentic recommendations and having a higher engagement rate. So the advice that we're sort of giving, and it's aligned with our where you shop matters and support local businesses, is small business should be thinking instead of geographical breadth, of local depth. Consumers are emerging from the pandemic looking at how they can reconnect with their communities. And small business, if they can manage how to position themselves in that nexus that reconnects consumers to communities, are going to be the ones that succeed. And experiences, offering something that is different, even within Singapore, because there is a vast array of cultural and social differences, really is the key to that. Thank you, Glenn. Campbell? I would approach it from a slightly different perspective. Um, in, in terms of expectations, I think we've had a, a honeymoon period over the past two years because people were grateful just to be able to travel. Usually they were traveling for um, you know, critical purposes. As things have returned to normal, people's expectations are returning to normal pretty quickly. So you know, it, it takes that bit more effort to keep your MPS up. People are looking at the, the maintenance and, and you know, cleanliness of your properties, its exterior. Have people been keeping up the hard work of making things spick and span? If people are coming with the same expectations now that they used to have pre-pandemic and we cannot get away with a shoddy product. So I'd encourage all of us, you know, as, as we have challenges with labor supply, as we have challenges with, with you know, foreign nationals who are able to converse in, in the language of tourists coming to Singapore, you know, we, we really have to consider what is the customer expecting. If we don't meet their expectations, they're going to be disappointed. If they're disappointed, they're going to tell other people, and then it's going to become a negative cycle. I love that because I think um, uh, for many of us over the last two years, we've talked a lot about how the pandemic has changed travel patterns. And I think to a great extent it has, where like Glenn said, we want to go deeper. But at the same time, the innate need to travel, our expectations actually quickly bounce back. That's just human behavior. Yeah, Caesar? Uh, I agree. Um, well, uh, what Campbell uh, shared earlier, uh, there's an increase in and, and, and customer spending. Uh, that's right, well, our data shows that um, there's a huge pent up demand, uh, not only um, the amount of uh, 
uh, the spend that the customers is willing to uh, the, the amount that customers are willing to spend when they travel uh, but also uh, since the uh, vaccinated travel framework was announced uh, there was a huge jump in number of booking volume uh, more than three times in our platform and and these customers you know th this is a pent-up demand and these customers have been uh, they are quite familiar they are traveling to a familiar uh, destination and have been uh, looking uh, for um, something that they're familiar with so destinations like uh, U universal studio singapore or garden by the bay will continue to become uh, to be popular but these customers have higher expectation of their travel uh, because they now uh, appreciate their time in singapore even more and this is when uh, this is uh, uh, where uh, the local uh, uh, experience within Singapore uh, needs to be stand out. Uh, and as, as our custom, uh, customers are willing to explore more outside the, uh, in addition to the popular destinations. Just to give example, I, I, when, I was in, uh, when I visited Singapore um, uh, uh, first time uh, since the pandemic, I started exploring uh, local experience. So I, I discovered dark tours uh, in Traveloka platform, uh, as well as the you know Singapore Heritage Tour uh, of, of Chinatown, um, something like that uh, within within uh, within the platform. So this is uh, this is something that customers will look for beyond just the popular destinations, um, uh, and 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 I th I, I think. Um, the operators within Singapore should really um, invest in, uh, uh, in in that area. Yeah, so hopefully we'll have many tourists just like Caesar who are going to be exploring <laughs> Singapore even more deeply than they, they were before. Well, I, I also wanted to uh, take this opportunity to ask Glenn a macroeconomics question uh, related to travel, because as Keith had, had uh, Keith and, and MOS had mentioned just now, um, and I again had uh, heard a lot of this in Europe about the worries about um, the Ukraine war and worries about cost of living. I wanted to ask Glenn specifically whether you think that mid-term, long-term travel demand will be resilient or how will it be affected, if at all? Uh, you know, I mean, it's obviously a, a key focus and it's one of the surprises of the recovery from the COVID recession is that inflation has been so strong so soon. But when you take a step back, uh, you know, an economist characterizes inflation or rises in the cost of good living as the persistence of excess demand over excess supply. And we really have been living in a goods concentrated world. This entire area of services, be it dining out, be it travel, has been closed to us. So the availability of what we can spend on has been smaller. So we've seen more spending and we've seen supply chains um, clogged as a result of that. So that's one of the key reasons for the inflation pressures is the demand side. And we're closely watching what happens as you see this rotation to services. And interestingly, from our data, we find that around when 30 to 40% of the population is vaccinated, that's when consumers are more comfortable engaging in high touch services, be it dining out, be it traveling again. And that's lower than any estimate of herd immunity. So it suggests that vaccination works as a confidence channel. And what we really need to see is kind of like the relaxation of uh, sort of border controls and mobility restrictions and the opening up to allow that vaccination confidence multiplier to actually work. So on the first point, I think as we see a rotation from goods to services, a larger spectrum uh, for consumers to spend on, some of the inflation pressures will abate. The final point I wanted to make on this is, you know, we've heard the term hiatus used, we've heard the sort of discussion about sort of the lack of change in the past two years. There's been a very important change that has continued unabated. Gen Z continues to enter the workforce and become new time consumers. This baton change from millennials to Gen Z 
um, is continuing. And Gen Z is the most ethnically, religiously, culturally diverse population or generation ever. They're 30% of the Singapore population, they're 28% of the global population. And they have very specific views about what they expect from a brand. 75% expect a brand to have purpose that aligns with them. 75% are prepared to pay a premium for brands that provide sustainability and traceability. So what this highlights is it's a generation that has a degree of price inelasticity if you are going to provide the purpose-driven goods that they're looking for. So, you know, it's another opportunity for small business. We have this purpose-driven consumers who are growing in share and they're just looking for purpose-driven businesses to be able to meet them. Yeah, so just to, again, ride on Glenn's point, again, the, what I've been hearing a lot in market is there are a lot of concerns, but if there is a good reason for them to travel, if there is something for them to experience after they go to a destination, hopefully they will put their money where their, their mouth is and travel um, to Singapore. Um, I saw a couple of questions uh, uh, in relation to twinning as well, and so I was going to ask Campbell um, a question around that. But maybe prior to that, I wanted to give a little bit of a preamble about how um, Singapore Tourism Board has been looking at twinning or mono Singapore um, marketing over the last uh, couple of years. I know for many of us uh, in, in the room, um, there are uh, traditionally for our long haul markets, Singapore has often been twinned with one of our neighboring destinations. And Singapore actually in the last six months or so, STB in the last six months or so, um, I, I, it might surprise some in the room, but we've had a lot of, uh, we've had some success in pushing mono Singapore destinations um, in our European and our US markets. Just to cite a couple of examples, um, uh, I fly on in the UK, uh, if only, uh, TUI in Germany, um, premier holidays from the UK have all been pushing uh, mono Singapore uh, destinations of three to uh, five nights. In fact, we were really um, uh, heartened by uh, Les Maisons du Voyage, one of the biggest tour operators in France, where they on average um, sold uh, about a, a few hundred packages, which is large by the last few months' standards. On average, their visitors, uh, their customers stayed in Singapore for 4.61 nights. So Singapore STB um, will continue to try to push Mono Singapore or longer stays um, in, in Singapore. Um, uh, and I, I wanted to use this to lead into the question of what is going to happen to twinning? There, there are some people who say, is twinning dead? Kenville, you want to, to respond to that? And if, if Caesar and, and Glenn have, uh, have, uh, have any views on that, we can jump in as well later. Well, firstly, congratulations on the success of uh, the, the Mono Singapore program. I, I mean, Singapore has always... Um, been unfairly maligned as a place where there's not enough to do for a long mono-stay holiday. Uh, I've been trying to convince people otherwise for 26 years. <laughs> uh, but the, the reality is I think some of the success of mono-sing in this time is just simply the inconvenience of doing multiple destination itineraries, the testing, the quarantine, the, the risk, um, the uncertainty. And, and so it, it is not the future. And I think you know, to use your statistic of 4.61 days, if you're flying 13, 14, 17 hours to this region from Europe or the US or elsewhere, you're not going to spend that time flying for a 4.61 day holiday in one country. So the reality is that twinning and, and, and using Singapore as an extended transit stop in some cases uh, has to be the, the foundation for volume. Uh, by all means, let's do our utmost to get people to stay longer and more people to do mono sing but uh, we, we cannot forget the importance of twinning. Caesar, would you like to, or Glenn? Sure, sure. Uh, just building on top of what uh, Campbell just shared, uh, I think, well, I'm very optimistic that uh, twinning will come back, right? Because a, 
with of course the the issue with uh, with travel today that we we, we are seeing um, in, in in through our customer survey is is the friction of travel, the costs associated with uh, the uh, you know the the tests required and quarantine and and with uh, v, VTF um, Singapore literally I think there, you know there's no the friction has gone down to zero. And this is actually an opportunity for 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 the market to capture uh, uh, to to capture transiting travelers because yeah, there's no more restriction, right? Uh, I think it's just uh, our job as an industry players to really collaborate and create um, uh, a product that makes sense and help this uh, distribute and reach these travelers um, uh, to be able to uh, uh, spend spend time in Singapore transiting. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to pick up on, on Campbell's point and also Caesar's, um, you know, obviously the experience needs to be frictionless and from a capacity perspective, you need to see a return of the hub and spoke network. But I think also an important consideration is we talk about sort of the end of the physical health aspects of the pandemic. Um, there's a less documented mental health pandemic which is following. And I think as a result of that, people are looking for stress-free experiences. And I think this is the reason why Mono Singapore has been so successful. Um, you know, I mean, just the itineraries, the sort of the risk, the waiting times, the delays. Um, at this stage, I think twinning is introducing stress and burden into that. Um, and you know, if Singapore can actually harness that wellness opportunity that people are probably going to other destinations as the twin to Singapore and embed that sort of into events. So you have learning, you have wellness, two positive experiences amplified together. That becomes a really important capture opportunity. But I think we need to get through this period of sort of normalization where people are sort of perhaps a little bit more I don't want to use the word triggered, but it's the one that comes to mind by inconvenience before we see twinning really take off. Juliana, so can just I to add, be, add yeah, one point? Go ahead, uh, I think you know, whilst mono sing is, is obviously ideal, there's a really strong short term opportunity here for transit. Uh, because if you look at any of the other aviation hubs in Asia, none of them have restored as much connectivity as Singapore by, by not even close margins. Uh, so you know, people are funneling through Singapore to get from A to B. And so let's use this opportunity of uh, unusually strong demand for coming through Singapore to get people out of the airport whilst this advantage lasts. Thank you so much, Campbell. I, I was being deliberately provocative, as all of you know. Um, twinning uh, is, remains very much central to Singapore Tourism Board strategy as well. Of course, we will continue to push uh, Mono Singapore and longer stays in Singapore, even as they move on to somewhere else. But twinning is certainly uh, 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 something that we know is what customers, what travellers want, and we hope that our protocols within Asia will hopefully be aligned. Now that everywhere is opening up more, there was a lot of excitement that many parts of Southeast Asia at least are opening up and protocols are more aligned, that twinning will come back uh, in full force, um, hopefully very soon. Um, perhaps uh, I have about five minutes, uh, only about five minutes uh, left. Maybe I could uh, just um, speak a little bit about the elephant in the room, um, which Campbell touched on uh, briefly just now as well. There were a couple of questions relating around mainland China as a market. One of the questions uh, was, um, uh, any idea when mainland China might reopen? I'm not sure if uh, um, perhaps Campbell or... Right. Yeah. Everyone's got a theory on this. Everyone's got a reason and a, and a, and a prognosis. Um, I, I think we're, we're not banking on anything significant, at least at Scoot, not banking on anything significant to well into the second half of this calendar year, probably 2023. Um, I, can, I can share also, since I recently moved back from China, that the theories vary from pilots in June this year, at least a few months ago, um, to all the way to 2023 at least. So again, I think we, we, um, there's no clarity at this point, especially right now, um, but there was a question around what is STB's strategy in China? 
as uh, China remains a very key market for um, Singapore tourism um, because it is one of the largest markets in the world uh, when, when uh, post pandemic. So we all continue to invest. I cited the example of uh, Douyin and TikTok. That's just one of like 20 different marketing activities that we've been doing in the in the last one two years, and we will continue to to uh, push on on that. Yeah. So um, gonna, maybe. For those of you who aren't aware, the, the fact that we're not flying much to China is, is not a choice. <laughs> we, we have a governmental constraint of at, at most five flights per week to the whole of China from Singapore, from, from the Singapore-based airlines. As soon as the governments open up, we will be deploying capacity back. So it's not our choice. We want to go back. Our future is as dependent on China as everyone else's. Well, maybe I'll just ask one last question linked to sustainability, which I'm going to pose to Glenn um, as well as to Campbell. I think uh, along the lines of all the talk about sustainability becoming extremely important for our travellers uh, and our world uh, increasingly, the question is, how do we rationalise the need to reduce our carbon footprint versus the, the footprint of um, tourism? Yeah, perhaps I could get Glenn to speak about that first before, and from an aviation perspective, Campbell could speak about it. Okay, just, uh, just quickly. Uh, I mean, sustainability, traceability, uh, you know, it's undeniable that we've emerged through this period a lot more introspective, not just questioning our work-life balance, but, you know, questioning our whole relationship with the environment and all these dynamics. And we have an enormous amount of accumulated leave. Uh, most people, we're fortunate enough that most people in the audience probably also have accumulated savings. So I think one of the dynamics that we see after this sort of return to short-term travel is that we'll probably see a return to what I'd call slow travel or people taking longer trips that can, you know, account for some of these frictions. Um, and taking these longer trips, you know, not sort of uh, flying as much, perhaps using trains, uh, et cetera, I think, you know, does start to reduce that footprint and it allows people to sort of be more immersive uh, in the culture. So I think sort of this return to slow tourism and sort of more curated and organised uh, travel as opposed to spontaneous will sort of be one of the elements on the demand side that, uh, that uh, helps with that. I think that we need to keep in perspective that sustainability has, at least as, as portrayed by UN, has three elements. It's environmental, societal, and governance. Um, and, and by all means, we need to do our part on environment because it's not just an expectation of our customers and of governments, it's also an expectation of our staff and our shareholders. Uh, so there's plenty of initiatives that aviation is undertaking to reduce the carbon footprint with the objective of being net zero by 2050. Singapore Airlines Group, including Scoot, is well involved with this. One of the key initiatives is sustainable aviation fuel, which has been trialled. Uh, Singapore is leading the way together with CAG and, and others involved. So, so that side of the business, environmental carbon footprint reduction is being done. But how do we rationalise tourism in that context? One, we're reducing the footprint, but two, we've seen over the past two years what happens to societies, to livelihoods, to industries when there is no travel. And that is a societal sustainability responsibility that we have. So it, nothing is binary. It's a matter of trade-offs. And so I firmly believe that travel can coexist in a more sustainable future. Wonderful point. So to round off, I, I'm just going to ask um, Caesar, Campbell and Glenn to share, as Singapore reopens to the world, if you have one thing to tell the audience, what should we do in order to ride on this tourism recovery? What would that be? Caesar, may I ask you to start? Uh, sure, sure. Um, I think as an operator, uh, you all will be fighting not only for customer uh, share of wallet, uh, but share of time. Uh, just make sure that you invest in uh, discoverability uh, of your products and services through social media, uh, multiple channel, social media, digital platform like, uh, like us. Uh, you can. Um, uh, help, uh, we can help your product uh, be uh, reach the right customer across the region uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, as you know, um, this is as in response to the new 
consumer trend uh, after the pandemic. Uh, be prepared. Don't wait for demand to come and, and then figure out how to deal with it. It's going to come quickly. You saw my slide. Uh, you know, if we don't deal, if we don't prepare for this, it's going to be a bad experience and all the consequences I mentioned before. So act now. Act now. Okay. I think to me the most disappointing outcome would be if we just sort of return to normal. Um, as we close down, we adopted new technologies, we innovated, we found new ways of connecting to each other and communicating. We adapted very, very rapidly to the biggest rupture in over a century. And I would say to use that same spirit of innovation, of looking for new solutions, of how we connect, harnessing the power and the advantages of these new mediums that we have, um, in terms of advertising, in terms of brand awareness. I think if this period we've been through of really rapid adjustment and change and technological deepening was just to yield to what we had before, I think that would be an incredibly disappointing outcome. Well, we've run out of time. I, I hope it was a useful session for, for um, everybody. And I wanted to say a big thank you to our three speakers, Glenn, Campbell, and Caesar from Jakarta. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, another plug for my breakout sessions later. Do join us in the afternoon. Yeah, thank you so much.